Well, good morning, church. As always, it is so good to be here with you this morning as we get to open God's Word and continue along in the Psalms. And today, what we will be doing is looking at what kind of king we have as we turn to Psalm 99. So if you have your Bible with you, turn to Psalm 99 with me. And if you don't have a Bible, there should be one in front of you, in one of the pockets in front of the seats or one of the gray buckets underneath. It would be good to have a Bible open with us as we go verse by verse through this psalm. What kind of king is our Lord? You know, I remember about a year ago, we were out on the field, the building had been locked, and we had a decision to make on what we were going to do once the building got locked. And the decision was made that we were going to have service out in the field. And there was one particular Sunday, I remember, when the forecast wasn't so good, and we looked up at the sky, and there were clouds all around, and it just might thunder, it just might lightning, everyone might have to run for their cars, but, you know, what should we do? We didn't have a place to meet inside, outside was our only option, and well, we decided we were going to meet, and we were going to hear God's word preached, we were going to sing together on the field, and I remember sitting with, everyone had their umbrellas out in the rain, it was pouring down, and you could still hear the songs of the saints lifting up to the heavens, as even in the rain, there we were singing. The, the question is, why were we doing that? I think there were people driving along, lo, along Lob Singer wondering, who are these crazy people that are sitting out in the rain and with their umbrellas out, and for goodness sakes, it might even start thundering and lightning soon. Well, the reason why we did that is because Christ is our king, and he deserves to be praised whether it's in the rain or whether, whether it's in a beautiful building like this. And that's what we're looking at today as we get to Psalm 99. You see, as we've been going through the Psalms, Pastor Will and I this summer, uh, we've been going through different types of Psalms. That's kind of how it's worked out. We've seen a lament Psalm, that's when we cry out to the Lord because we're at the end of ourselves. We've seen a praise psalm, we've seen wisdom psalms, and here we come to a specific type of praise psalm. It's a psalm that's called an enthronement psalm because it talks about the Lord as king, ultimately Christ as king, and then it gives reason for praise, and the reason for praise is all linked to his kingship. So as we walk through this today, I want us to think about this. The Lord is our king. And he deserves our worship because he is holy, he loves justice, and he answers prayers. That's what we're going to see today. The Lord is our king, and he deserves our worship because he is holy, he loves justice, and he answers prayer. He deserves our fealty because he is king of everything, all the world. So let's read this psalm together, then we'll dive into the text and learn more about our king. Psalm 99, verse 1. The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. They called to the Lord and he answered them. In the pillar of the cloud he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies and the statute that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them. You are a forgiving God to them, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Let's pray. Father, we declare you to be our king this morning, our holy king, and that you reign even now. As we look into this text written so long ago, through your Holy Spirit, I ask that we would learn more about our great King. I pray that we would have more wonder of him, but more importantly, Lord, I pray that there would be those here 
uh, who are sinners in need of a Savior that would cry out to our forgiving King and would turn to Jesus Christ and be saved. I pray that you would be with us as we walk through this. Be with me and help me to uh, present what is here and not present what is not. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So we come to verse 1 of Psalm 99. This is the last of the enthronement psalms, as I said. And we learn in the first stanza, this is our first point today, that the Lord is the holy king who deserves our praise. The Lord is our holy king. And it kind of starts off with a bang, if you think about it. Look at the first line there. It says, the Lord reigns. Here we have a declaration of the kingship of the Lord. The Lord reigns. This is a very familiar phrase in the enthronement psalm. So if you were to flip back to a few earlier, in Psalm 97.1, we have the exact same phrase, the Lord reigns. Psalm 96.10 again. Psalm 93, verse 1, just to name a few. And we see this again and again, the Lord reigns. The word reigns here is a verbal form of the word king. So it's very much a declaration of the Lord's kingship. He's not reigning as a magistrate. He's not reigning just as uh, someone who is not the king. No, he is reigning as the king. That is what this is saying. Literally, it would be the Lord is kinging. He is king. He reigns. And as we've seen in our short walk through the Psalms this summer, when we get to our Bibles and see the word L-O-R-D, Lord in all capitals, what we are coming to is the covenant name of God. And that's repeated again and again throughout this psalm. It's not the word Lord that would be Adonai, would just, you could say that of a person, you know, coming up to the human king and saying, Lord, that would be Adonai. It's not God. No, this is the covenant name of the Lord. This is Yahweh. So here what we are doing is we are taking the name of God and saying that he is the one reigning. And what this covenant name does is it links him to the covenant with Abraham, with Moses, with David. And what we see is that specifically... The Lord, Yahweh, is the one that is reigning. And the fact that the Lord reigns causes something to happen. If you look at the next part of that line, it says, The Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. So one of the results of the Lord's reign, that the Lord is king, is that the people are to tremble. And this will remind us of last week with Pastor Will's sermon, where we learned that the Lord's presence, when we're in the Lord's presence, we are to tremble. Well, the same is true of the reign of God. Reign of the Lord, the reign of Yahweh. If he is in control, and if he is the king of everything, then we need to have a holy reverence for him. Then we get to the next line, and it parallels the first, and says something very similar in a different way. And we see this again and again in the Psalms. This is actually how Hebrew poetry mainly works, is you'll have a line, then you'll have a very similar way in that it's said. And so we look here, and it says, He sits... He is Yahweh. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. So here we have a picture of a king sitting on his throne. So we have the line, the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. And now we have he sits enthroned on the cherubim, upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. Now the word here isn't, the word enthroned actually isn't in the Hebrew text. It says he sits upon the cherubim. But the kingship theme is so obvious that I think when we get to our English translations and we add he sits enthroned, or some of your translations just might have he is enthroned, it shows the aspect of the sitting being, sitting upon a throne, showing that Yahweh is indeed the king. He is the king. So, it is appropriate for the enthronement translation. But here it shows his throne in more specific, um, more specific way. It says this. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. So one thing we have to ask is what does it mean by upon the cherubim? Well, I think in a specific way it's pointing to the Ark of the Covenant. One of the reasons for that is the next line. It says the Lord is great in Zion. Zion being the mountain that the temple is built on. But on that mountain we have the temple. Solomon built the temple, and on the temple, we have the holy of holies, the most holy place within the temple, and within that most holy of holies, we have the Ark of the Covenant. 
The Ark of the Covenant is a box, and on that box is a golden lid, and upon that golden lid are two cherubim with their wings spread out over top. And so when we see he sits enthroned upon the cherubim, he sits enthroned upon the Ark, it's actually planting the Lord and saying that he is indeed Lord over Israel. It's pointing again to his covenant. Now what is a cherubim? I don't want you to think of the little cherubs from pop culture. You think Cupid sometimes when you think of cherubim or those little precious moment dolls. You remember those? Like little cute things with wings. And they're like, there's a cherub. No, that's not what we're talking about. A cherubim from the Old Testament and even the New Testament are winged creatures. They're a hybrid body of an animal and a man. And we actually see similar creatures in Isaiah Isaiah 6, when Isaiah is called, we see it in Ezekiel 1, we see it in Revelation with the four creatures around the throne, these hybrids of man and animals with wings, and really, they're around the Lord, and what they are there for is to show his majesty. He is above these very imposing figures. You see the cherubim, and you're like, wow, those are majestic creatures, but they are absolutely nothing in compared with our Lord who sits upon them. He's actually just their throne, his throne. So yes, while we're to look at the Ark of the Covenant and think of the Lord who made a covenant with his people, we are also to think of how even the mighty cherubim are but his seat. He sits upon them. It's speaking of his power and so too the result of his enthronement. And again, we have a result, right? The first one was the Lord reigns, the Lord is kinging, let the people tremble. And then it says he sits enthroned upon the cherubim and it says let the earth quake. So just as the people tremble, so too does the very earth. And really these lines are saying the same thing. The Lord is king and one of the proper proper responses is to tremble before him. But next we see where the center of the Lord's reign is during the Old Testament times, and that's found in verse 2. Look at that. It says, the Lord is great in Zion. First off, we have a declaration of the greatness of the Lord, the greatness of Yahweh. This is playing off of the verse before where we talked about his reigning, we talked about his enthronement, and the obvious progression would be that the Lord is great. But he is great in a place in this particular instance, this verse. It is in Zion where he is great. Again, Zion, the mountain of God, where the temple is, where the cherubim that they are referring to are. It's here where he resides during the Old Covenant. And it is here where he is in the midst of his covenant people from whom in the Old Testament his kingdom reaches out. So the way it worked was that He had a chosen people that that would then show the kingdom of God to the entire world. So there's a center to the Lord's reign in the Old Covenant time. But even though there is a center to the Lord's reign, I want you to note that his reign is not limited to Zion. It's not limited to Israel. No, in fact, his reign is over every single person. So look at the next part of the verse. It says in verse 2, it says that the Lord is great in Zion. It gives a specificity to where he is great. But then it says he is exalted over all peoples. So while, yes, he is great in Zion or in Jerusalem, and again, it's the center of the old covenant reign of the Lord, his reign will cover the entire earth. In fact, during this time, his reign indeed does cover all the entire earth. He's over all people. There is no person, there is no thing, there is nothing that comes even close to a minuscule amount of the glory of our great Lord. You'll notice that all peoples are to exalt him or lift him up. But then we get to verse 3 where it says, let them praise your great and awesome name. And who is them? It says, let them. It's referring to all the peoples from the verse before. So all peoples of the world are called to praise the great and awesome name of Yahweh. And this was sung in Israel. This was sung as they were declaring Yahweh as king. 
And here they were saying, no, it's not just us that needs to do this. It's the entire world that needs to do this because all praise, all glory of all the people does, is what he deserves as they praise his great and awesome name. And it wasn't looking just to a time in the future. It was looking for a time right then as we can see even in the story of Jonah, when Jonah is sent to the Assyrians, to the city of Nineveh, and said, no, you have to bow down to our Lord and repent. So yes, while he is great in Zion, where Jerusalem is the center, his reign covers the entire world. And then verse 3 shows, begins with showing how they are to exalt him. It says, let them praise your great and awesome name. All the peoples, they are to praise or sing. This word praise would actually have a public declaration aspect to it. We're not talking about closing your doors and just kind of whispering up songs to the Lord. No, it's saying get together with other worshipers of Yahweh and praise his name so that the entire earth can hear it. That's what it's saying. Because we come right from let them praise your great and awesome name, talking about over all the peoples. And so we see that those who serve Yahweh as king are actually told that they need to exalt in such a way that it will fill the entire earth and other people will be able to see how great and awesome our Lord is. I want you to notice the shift to the second person here. The rest of the psalm is written in the third person, but then here in verse 3 we have a shift to your great and awesome name. It's actually talking to the Lord. This is what you deserve. And what are they to praise? One, the name is great. We've gone over that. The Lord is great. And he is awesome. His name is awesome. Awesome means full of awe. It could also mean full of fear. And the same word awesome could actually be translated terrible. It's the same word. So when we have in this English, in our English vernacular now, the word awesome is just like you say it about everything. Like you're, you're like, man, that, you know, that TV show I watched was awesome or that movie I watched was awesome. And it cheapens the word. But when the Bible uses it, it's so much more than just cool. And it's so much more than just, oh, that was neat. It's, it's full of awe. It's jaw-dropping. It's terrible in the sense that there's nothing like it and I'm trembling with fear as we had in verse one. And that's what it means. So when we walk around and we say, that's awesome, that's awesome, that's awesome, I want you to remember that when the word is used in the Bible, it is used in a very different sense. It's not saying, praise your great and neat name. That would be sacrilegious, would it not? No. Praise your great and full of awe name, your great and terrible name. That's what it means. And then to put an exclamation point on that, it finishes with this first refrain that happens three times throughout the psalm, and it says, holy is he. And this section finishes with this proclamation, and it's a reason why praise is to be given. And it's a summary of all that came before from verses 1 to, verse, to the end of verse 3 as we see that, no, he is great, the people tremble, uh, he is awesome, he's exalted over all peoples. And then we have this line, holy is he. What that means is set apart. He's not like any other king. No, he's without flaw. He is far above all peoples. He is far above all other gods from other nations. They are nothing to him. Why? Because he is holy. No one is like our God. There's no place that has anyone like our God. There's no time where there is anyone like our God. Therefore, he is a king to be worshipped, not just by Israel, but by all the peoples of the earth. And you see the picture being painted here is of a majestic king sitting on a throne surrounded by glorious creatures. He's reigning from his throne and he's looking over the entire earth from Zion and he's saying, all you owe me fealty because I am the Lord your God. And he is the Lord our God and those who know it, our job is to praise him, as the psalm says. So if the Lord is our king, here's a few points of application, 
Therefore, he demands our allegiance. That's what a king does. A king demands allegiance. He demands fealty. A king will have a set of laws and says, you must follow these. Well, our Lord, the great king, has a set of laws and he does demand fealty of us. He sets the way that we worship. That's why we worship in the way that we do. That's why we decided uh, to continue to gather together because that was the stipulation that our Lord put on worship. We worship as a gathered people. This is why we sing together. This is why we sing psalms together every Sunday because uh, the Bible says we are to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We want to follow the way the Lord wants us to worship. Why? Because he's our king. And he gives us the law that we are to follow. And when we look at the law of God, which mainly is found throughout the first five books of the Bible, but then obviously it's expounded upon for the rest of the entire Bible in the Old and the New Testament. We're to follow what is written. That means that we are to read the Bible as our families, read the Bible as our churches, read the Bible as our schools, read the Bible as individuals, and then do what it says. And notice that we're not to be traitors that go after other gods. No, all fealty belongs to him. Why? Because the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. And so we give the Lord everything that we have. We are wholly committed to him. At the end of the section, it says he is holy. Holy is he. And there is a call because of the holiness of God in the Bible that we are to, Christians, are to also be set apart. We are people called out. We are people set apart. We are a people that are called to be holy. That is, a people called to be different than those around us. Partly that means without sin. We are a people called to be forgiven of our sins and to increasingly be sanctified of our sins. But that also means in the way that we live, it's going to be different than those around us who do not call upon the name of Christ. Just like the people in Zion and the people in Jerusalem and the people in Israel would have lived in a very different way than the surrounding nations when they were following the Lord. And remember that he is the king of the whole world. He's not just king here in our particular church or in all the churches that are meeting right now. No, what it says here is he is exalted over all peoples and that the Lord reigns and that all the people should tremble. Therefore, we must expand his kingdom on earth. That's our job. That's what the mission of the church is in the last words of Christ, where because all authority has been given to Christ, he is our king. Therefore, we must go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We must expand his kingdom. And that means more than just talking and sharing the gospel. That means living like a Christian in every aspect of your life in the way you educate your kids, in the way you do your job, in the way you run your business, do so like a Christian, and you will be expanding his kingdom. And so we see that the king, our Lord, is a holy God who demands our worship. We learn that he is holy, he is great. Our second point, we're going to learn a little bit more of this king who demands our worship, and we see that the king, Yahweh, loves justice. So what is the king like? He is a supreme king, an all-powerful king, an omnipotent king that truly loves true biblical justice. So look at the next verse. We're going on verse 4 now. The king in his might loves justice. Do you see where I got that from? (laughs) He loves justice. It's right there. Now, as you might be able to see in the footnote of your Bible, it could also be rendered the might of the king loves justice, but they mean essentially the same thing. The might of the king is the king, and they both love justice. Again, we have the mightiness of the Lord being expounded upon, the king in his might, but we actually see how he's going to use that might, how he's going to use that strength. And we see that he loves justice. His might is used for justice. It could also be translated judgments. It's the same word, mishpat. 
Well, justice over the last few years has been a bit of a hot topic, hasn't it? We've had people taking the word justice and filling it with all kinds of things that I don't think the Bible teaches that the Lord enjoys. We have people saying that justice is an equality of outcome. We have people saying justice is looking for class differences. We have people saying that justice is having generations pay later and atone for the sins of their forefathers. There's a subsection of society that is trying to take this biblical word justice. It's a biblical word. It comes from the Bible. It's right here. This was written thousands of years ago. And trying to mold it into a Marxist or socialist term when biblical justice means something very different. And hear me when I say our king loves biblical justice. Justice according to his law. Now we have two things in this text that actually will help show us what biblical justice is. Now we can go through the entire Bible and you can get a really good definition of biblical justice, but what I want to do today is just look at this text where the word justice is used and we actually have two things that are going to show us, okay, this is what justice is. First one is this. You have established equity. Then it says, you have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. So the first part of biblical justice is equity. Equity does not mean equality. It's different, okay? Equity does not mean equality. And I want to show you this. So in Deuteronomy 25, you don't got to turn there, I'll just read it for you. 13 to 16, this is what it says about equity. You shall not have in your bag two kinds of weights a large and a small. You shall not have in your house two kinds of measures, a large and a small. A full and fair measure you shall have. A full and fair measure you shall have, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God has given you. For all who do such things, all who act dishonestly, are an abomination to the Lord your God. So here we have saying we need just weights and measures. What that means is you're not going to have your measure for how much grain or how much of an item you're going to give somebody and you have like the full one for the people you like and then you have like this slightly smaller one that will make you a little bit more of an income uh, for the people you don't. And when you have different measures, because this is the scale that you are using in your dealings, when you have different scales for different peoples, what the Lord actually says is that that is an abomination to the Lord your God. So what it's saying is, if you're going to take different people and use different standards for them, which is what is exactly happening in our society right now, that is an abomination to the Lord. What the Lord wants and what equity means is that everyone has the same standard. That's what it's saying. Equity. Exodus 23, 1 to 3 says this, You shall not spread a false report. You shall not join hands with a wicked man to be a malicious witness. You shall not fall in with the many to do evil, nor shall you bear witness in a lawsuit siding with the many so as to pervert justice. Nor shall you be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. So there's two things that are happening here as we look at equity. Number one is, equity is not just seeing what the masses want and going with that. Did you hear it? It says, you shall not side with the many so as to pervert justice. No, there's a standard, just like we saw in Deuteronomy 25. There's a standard. We need just weights and measures for every single person, regardless of who they are. And that standard does not change, even if the many, the multitudes, the masses come and say, no, we need to change it. And then when we kind of see what's going on today, it even says in verse 3, you shall not be partial to a poor man in his lawsuit. Meaning this, you shall not be partial just because the person is not as well off as the other. They need the same standards. That's what equity is. Verse 9 of Exodus 23 says, You shall not oppress a so- sojourner. You know the heart, of, the heart of a sojourner, for you were once sojourners in the land of Egypt. That means you're not even going to take one class of people, like the Israelites, they were the chosen people. 
and then oppress another person, even though the ones who are in power now were once slaves. They were once in the land of Egypt. And because of that, you treat them with equity. You treat them with just weights and measures. You don't side with the many so as to pervert justice. No, you side with the law of God. And this carries on into the New Testament. James 2, 1 to 5 says this, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing and say, sit here in the good place, will you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet? Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? And talking to the church, what James is doing is taking the principles of the laws of God that I just read you and saying, it still matters today in the church. You have a rich person, you have a poor person in the church, you treat them the same. Why? Because the standard is the same. That is what equity is. And so as we come to a verse like this, and the king in his might loves justice, what we start filling up the word justice with is equity. Equal weight and measures. That's the first part. And right now we're in a society, well, in a just society, the weights and measures are equal regardless of rich or poor, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of anything. Same weights, same measures, always. And as I said before, the opposite is an abomination to the Lord. Also, as we get to this word justice, this word that seems to be a landmine in our society, we see that it is intrinsically linked with righteousness. So look at the next verse there. It says, you have executed justice, same word as the one earlier in verse 4, and righteousness in Jacob. So to be truly just, we need to look at God's law and know what is truly righteous. Because the standard, and I kept going off and saying, we need equal weights and measures. We need equal standards for everyone. Then you gotta ask yourself, okay, Pastor Andy, what is the standard? Well, the standard is the righteousness of God. The standard is the law of God as found throughout the Bible. That is what we look to. Justice is intrinsically linked with righteousness because when you go against the righteousness of God, all of a sudden you have injustice, not justice. The standard is God's law in a just and righteous society. Now you might ask yourself, well, what if that society doesn't believe in the Lord? Well, according to this psalm, that doesn't matter. Why? Because the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. Why? Because he's exalted over all peoples. Let them, let those peoples praise your great and awesome name. So if you want a truly just society, a truly just society will follow the law of God because justice and righteousness as found in the law of God are absolutely linked. You can't have one without the other. Because the Lord reigns. This is why we need to take righteousness... And we need to know the things that are unrighteous and unjust so that we don't do them. So for a society to allow gay marriage is not just. For a society to allow people to decide their gender is unjust. For a society to steal from people to distribute wealth is unjust. Why? Because the Bible says thou shalt not steal. Because the Lord says male and female he made them. And because it is an abomination to practice homosexuality. That's what the law of God says. So even though they'll come and say, well, we need to love everybody, is this not equal? Is this not fair? No, you look to the law of God and you see this is what righteousness is. That's how you define it. And that's how we see what is justice and what is not. And what we know for a fact from this text is that the king in his might loves justice. And like knowing the Lord is king of everything, this leads to our first rendition of the refrain, and we find that justice and righteousness, true justice and righteousness, leads to worship. Look at verse 5. Exalt the Lord our God, worship at his footstool, holy is he. Again, we're to lift up the Lord our God, 
Then we have the word worship. The nuance to this word in the Hebrew language is to bow down low. So when we see worship, it's to bow down at his footstool. We're to bow down to the feet of the Lord. Again, it's probably in a reference to the Ark of the Covenant and therefore to congregational worship in Israel. And so we're to come together, we're to see the great justice of our God, we're to see the great righteousness of our God, and what are we to do? Well, we're to fall on our faces at the feet of the Lord and worship him. That's what we do. And again, we have at the end of the refrain, the second time in this psalm, the statement, holy is he. He set apart, unlike anything, and unlike anyone, and his justice is true justice, and his righteousness is true righteousness. And really, the people of Israel were a big illustration for this. When they were following God's law and walking close with him, they were the epitome of justice, righteousness, and wisdom. And that's one of the reasons why we have the Queen of Sheba traveling for miles and miles to see King Solomon, to see his wisdom, and to see this place where the kingdom of God was, where Yahweh was king where society was just and righteous. And it led to the worship of the Lord as his kingdom was held up for everyone to see. Another way to think of it would be of being in a family restaurant for a dinner. You think of the vast arrays of families that are there. You have some kids that are crying. You have other kids that are fighting. You have other kids playing tag up and down the tables. You have other kids acting like pigs and just stuffing their food in their face as much as they can. But there's always like that one or two families there where the kids are well-behaved, they're polite, they're respectful. And you look at that scenario and you think to yourself, well, who do I want to get advice from? Well, I think obviously the good choice would be to go to that family whose kids were respectful and polite See, there is a superior way to raise children, and we get that from God's law just like everything else. But when people see the way that God's law works, when we see a society that is truly equitable and built upon true righteousness, what we are doing as we build that society, as we're building the kingdom of God, as we show the kingdom of God and the superiority of the kingdom of God, because our king is one who loves justice, and our king is the epitome of goodness. He is goodness, he is justice, and he is righteousness. So what do we need to do? We need to build our life on Christ by following the law of God. We need to do this in our home. For those of you who are about to have children or hope to have children, and you're thinking, well, how am I going to rear my children? How are we going to raise our kids? Well, I hope the first place that you're going to is the word. That's where true wisdom lies. How do you run your business? Are you fair in how you run your business? Do you have equal weights and measures? Do you do so in such a way that would uphold righteousness? And truly, we should be calling on our government to uphold God's law. And again, that seems to be a controversial statement nowadays. But it says right here that the Lord reigns and he is to be exalted over all people and that he loves justice and equity and that he loves righteousness. And therefore, I don't see why Christians would not be going to the government and telling them, this is what God's law says, this is the standard, this is what a just society looks like, and call them to that. That is what we should be doing. You see, we serve our king who is holy and we worship him. We serve our king who loves justice, true biblical justice, and because of that we worship him. And finally, our last point today is we serve our king who answers prayer. And for that reason, we worship him. See, we come to a point in the psalm where examples are given of our next point. We get to verse 6, and it says, Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Samuel also was among those who called upon his name. So we have three examples, and they all go toward communication with God. It says, Moses and Aaron were among his priests. Now, technically, if you want to get really nitpicky, you might come to me and say, well, Moses wasn't a priest, was he? Weren't those the Levites? Weren't those the line of Aaron? Well, before the implementation of Levitical worship, 
Moses definitely fulfilled the function of a priest. He offered sacrifices to God. He talked to God on behalf of his people. He even interceded for them on occasion. And so we have both Moses and Aaron being among his priests. It's a correct statement. Then we have Samuel, who also was one who called upon his name, called upon the name of the Lord. Samuel, one of the last judges of Israel, he called upon his name. And so the point that is being made here is one of being able to call upon the name of the king. So we get through this. The king loves justice. We've exalted him. And now it says, Moses, Aaron, and Samuel, they called upon the name of the Lord. And what happened is the Lord answered them. Look at the end of verse 6. They called upon his name. They called to the Lord, and he answered them. This is fantastic. He answered them when they called on him. You see, we have this king who, is, who reigns. We have this king. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. These great mighty creatures are like his throne. But in spite of that, in spite of his greatness, he is a God who listens to his people and answers them. That's amazing. I remember during the pandemic, I emailed our MPP and he did not answer me. He was more aloof than the Lord, apparently, because our Lord, he cares and he does answer. Gives an example of that. In the pillar of the cloud, he spoke to them. I think this is referencing Numbers 9, 15 to 18, with the pillar of fire at night and the pillar of cloud by day, and they actually would take cues from that as to whether they would go or they would stay. He answered them in that. You see, the Lord led them and instructed them and answered them when they called to him. But this God who answers those who call also demands fealty. They kept his testimonies in the statute that they gave him. So in 7 it says, In the pillar of the cloud he spoke to them. They kept his testimonies in the statutes that he gave to them. The Lord answers them ultimately at that time with the law. So the answering were testimonies and statutes and their job was to keep those statutes and testimonies. And you see there is always a connection between the Lord answering prayer and obedience. It's throughout the Bible. I'll give you one example. Isaiah 59 verse 2 says this, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. So yes, when we seek the Lord, he will be found. But if you have hidden sin in your life, if you have sin that you are holding on to because you love it in your life, then there is a very, very good chance that the Lord will not answer you. But here, in this psalm, When Moses, Aaron, and Samuel called upon his name, what happened? Well, he answered them. And in return, they kept his testimonies and the statutes that he gave them. Verse 8 says, O Lord our God, you answered them. You were a forgiving God to them. And so we see that in his answering, the Lord is a forgiving God. The implication here is that in part, these cries were cries asking for forgiveness. And he answered them and forgave them. See, the Lord will answer genuine cries for forgiveness. He will. But as we looked at before, he is righteous and just, and so no unconfessed sin will go unpunished. And it actually says it right here. You were a forgiving God to them, and then the immediately, immediately the next line is, but an avenger of their wrongdoings. So we know that sin has to be punished. And even sin that is forgiven will have consequences. So our Lord, our King, is both a forgiving God and an avenger of wrongdoing. He will forgive, but sin still needs to be punished. This verse is telling us that he doesn't just forgive without a price being paid. In the Old Testament, they would look forward to Christ by sacrificing animals And again, we see that our king is a king that answers, and more than that, he forgives while remaining completely just, and it leads us to worship our king as we hit this last refrain, verse 9, exalt the Lord our God, 
Worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. Knowledge of our king again leads to worship. It leads us to bow down. This time at his holy mountain, another word for Zion. And it ends with a declaration for the third time that the Lord our God is holy. He is set apart and there's no one like him. So we get to our points of application. Our Lord, being both a forgiving God and an avenging God, is actually most perfectly seen in the cross of Christ. In the cross of Christ, we see the forgiveness of our God. See, we have a sinful people that are in need of forgiveness, and when we call out to the Lord and ask his forgiveness and go to Christ, then our forgiving God will forgive us. But he's also an avenger of wrongdoing, so that, as I said, sin cannot go unpunished. This is why Christ had to die. He died in my place, he died in your place, so that the punishment meant for me was put upon Christ and so that the Lord would still be seen as righteous and just because sin was punished. This way, sin is not overlooked because it has been punished as it needs to be. And there's only one person that can be our substitute. The sacrifice of lambs and bulls, as the book of Hebrews says, was not good enough. It only pointed to our perfect sacrifice. Only Christ was our true substitute. In order to receive forgiveness, we need to put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to repent of our sins, and the Lord will forgive you. And your sins will then be punished in Christ on the cross. And the righteousness of Christ will be put upon you, and the Lord will see you as if you've never sinned. And you will be given a new heart that loves the Lord and loves to follow the law of God. And you will increasingly be one that executes justice in the land. See, we have a king who answers when we call. If that's you today, if you've never trusted in Jesus before, we do have an avenging God, one who avenges of their wrongdoings, as it says in verse 8. If you're not in Christ, then the presence of the Lord in the day of judgment is not a good place to be. If you're found to be in Christ, it will be the most glorious place to be. But my prayer for you and my call to you today is put your faith in Jesus and you can be forgiven of your wrongdoings and the Lord will see you as if you've never sinned. For those of us who are in Christ, we need to understand that we serve a king who answers our call. We need to pray to him. The New Testament says we are to pray without ceasing. We are to pray to him when we're in need, but more than that, we need to uh, communicate with him in such a way to show that he is our king and we are dependent upon him. And all this should lead to worship. We need to worship at his holy mountain. We need to worship at his footstool. We need to point to all of creation and say that all of creation needs to worship our king. It's why we sing to him. It's why we live our lives the way we do to him. It's why we gather together and lift up our voices. Our king is great. He reigns over everything and is to be exalted over all peoples. All peoples are to praise him. He loves justice and righteousness. So too, we need to love justice and righteousness. He answers when we cry to him and when we cry out for forgiveness, he will forgive while still remaining just by punishing sin. When it comes down to what we find in the New Testament, that the king ultimately is Christ. Christ is the king of the church. All authority has been given to him. So we need to praise him. We need to understand that all glory goes to him. In fact, when we get to Revelation, the book of Revelation, we see a picture of Christ on the throne with multitudes from every nation and every tongue bowing down to him as king. And we are in his kingdom right now. And whatever you do, you need to do to proclaim his kingdom and further it. You can proclaim Christ as Savior, Lord, and King in the way that you live, the way that that you live that conforms to God's law and shows your fealty belongs to him. We can show our fealty to the Lord by how we sing. We need to give him all glory. Again, we need to give him all glory in how we live and what we say and what we sing. Why? 
because Christ is worthy. He is a king that came down and sacrificed for his people. And in return, we are to give him everything because we have a king who is worthy. Amen.